If you have benefited from resources produced by G3 Ministries, would you consider donating to support us? Even a few dollars helps us to continue to publish free curricula, articles, podcasts, video resources, and more. Visit g3min.org slash give or open the G3 app to give a one-time or monthly donation. Articles from G3 Ministries Song of the Anointed, written and recorded by Scott Aniel. Central to a proper image of blessedness as expressed in the Psalms is a conception of God's rule as that which brings flourishing, rather than conceiving it as burdensome. God pronounced a blessing upon Adam in Genesis 1.28 that gave him the right to rule as God's chosen representative under God's ultimate authority. God made man to have dominion over the works of his hands. He put all things under his feet. Adam, however, failed. He conceived of God's rule as bonds to be broken, and he disobeyed the command of God. Adam forfeited his right to rule as God's regal representative. Yet, God's intent to bless man by giving him rule over all things under his ultimate rule did not end with Adam's failure. God still intends to bless humankind through the mediatorial rule of an anointed one. And this is a critical element of a proper image of blessedness. One first introduced in Psalm 2 and developed throughout the Psalter. An ungodly conception of blessedness that casts off the rule of God also rejected his anointed, as Psalm 2.2 states. The term translated anointed in the Psalms and throughout Scripture is the word Messiah and refers to God's chosen kingly representative. Therefore, we must understand the nature of this anointed one and how he plays into a proper conception of blessedness in submission to God's rule. In the Old Testament, a special anointing of God's Spirit was given to those leaders who served as mediators between Yahweh and his people. In a sense, they serve in a role similar to what had been promised to Adam, God's vice-regent on earth. The first to be Spirit-anointed in this way was Moses, who then shared some of that anointing with the elders of Israel. Other anointed mediators include Joshua, judges such as Gideon and Samson, and prophets such as Elijah. Priests were also anointed with oil, which symbolized a similar role of serving as mediators between God and his people. But God uniquely anointed Israel's kings. He first anointed Saul, but then took away that anointing when he forfeited his reign. That anointing was instead given to David. Although Psalm 2 does not have a superscription attributing authorship, the apostles attribute it to David in Acts 4.25. This doesn't surprise us. David is the most well-known author of the Psalms. He did not write them all, of course, but he is certainly featured. And in fact, David is a central focus of how the entire collection of Psalms were intentionally organized. David was God's anointed king, God's representative ruler on earth. God made a covenant with David to this effect. Yahweh is the sovereign ruler over all things, but he specifically chose David to be his anointed king on earth. He told David, And it shall be when your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. Psalm 2 refers to this promise in verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. The one speaking in this verse is the king that God set on Zion. This is the Lord's anointed. And when he says that the Lord said to him, You are my son, he is quoting God's covenant with David. God had promised David, I will be his father and he shall be my son. Psalm 2 is quoting God's promise to David that his son would continue his kingly line as God's anointed. References to God's anointed like this appear in at least nine psalms. Psalm 2, 18, 20, 28, 45, 84, 89, 105, and 132. 
and two of those psalms specifically mention God's promises to David's seed, Psalms 18 and 89. God made this covenant with David following a significant event that helped to firmly establish David's rule in Israel, bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The center of Yahweh's rule had been his tabernacle, where the Ark of the Covenant was housed as a symbol of his presence. The Ark had been captured by the Philistines prior to Saul's reign, and the tabernacle was moved from Shiloh to Gilgal and eventually Gibeon, north of Jerusalem. In the same region, Gibeah had been King Saul's capital city. By bringing the Ark of God to his capital city in Jerusalem, David was uniting God's throne with his throne. He was submitting his rule to God's rule. In this context, God promised to establish David's kingdom and appoint his son as the one who would build God's house in David's capital city. In this context also, David composed a great hymn of thanks. This song is significant in the book of Psalms and becomes key for understanding the organization and progression of thought throughout the five books. Portions of David's hymn of thanks appear in at least 12 Psalms. Particularly prominent is David's great refrain, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. 1 Chronicles 16.34 This refrain appears in many psalms, and it was also notably sung at the dedication of Solomon's temple in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. The following portion of David's hymn appears in at least two psalms. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established, it shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad, and let them say among the nations, The Lord reigns. And the final doxology of David's hymn appears at the end of Book 1 and Book 4 of the Psalter. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Interestingly, a superscription for Psalm 96 in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, says that the psalm, taken almost in its entirety from David's hymn of thanks, was sung when the house was built after the captivity, referring to the rebuilt temple after God's people returned from exile. It is quite clear, then, that David's hymn of thanks in 1 Chronicles 16, along with God's covenant in 1 Chronicles 17, are very important in the book of Psalms. This is even less surprising when we consider that Ezra may have both written 1st and 2nd Chronicles and edited the canonical form of the Psalter. The five books of the Psalter are in a significant way an unfolding of the Davidic covenant, God's promise to David that his throne would be established forever through his seed. As I've already noted, when Psalm 2 speaks of Yahweh's anointed, It refers to David and his seed. Not only that, even the blessed man of Psalm 1 alludes to God's anointed leader as well. For example, when Psalm 1, 1 and 2 describe the blessed man as one who refrains from three things, walks not, nor stands, nor sits, and does one thing, delights in Yahweh's law, it resembles commands given to Israel's king in Deuteronomy 17, 16 through 20 where he is told to refrain from three things, multiply horses, wives, or silver and gold, and do one thing, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. Further, the pronouncement in Psalm 1-3 that whatever he does shall prosper brings to mind God's command to an earlier anointed leader of Israel, Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Joshua 1.8 Again, this is in the context of God's chosen leader for his people. The imagery of a flourishing tree in Psalm 1 also reminds the reader of God's promise of blessing to Adam, his first chosen royal representative. The psalmist is intentionally using images that describe not just any blessed man, but specifically one in the line of Adam, Moses, Joshua, and ultimately David. That imagery is only intensified in Psalm 2, 
with explicit mention of Yahweh's anointed and quotation of the Davidic covenant. The specific connection between God's anointed one and delighting in his law is also key to the overarching image of blessedness the Psalms portray. Psalms 1 and 2, which form an important introduction to the whole canonical structure of the Psalms, are a pairing of a Torah psalm, Psalm 1, with a Messianic psalm, Psalm 2. The other two important Torah psalms, Psalms 19 and 119, are also paired with Messianic psalms, Psalm 18, 20-24, and 110, at key junctures in the progression of the Psalter. David's first heir was Solomon, and thus we would expect to see him appear in the Psalms. Indeed, Solomon has two Psalms ascribed to him, both included at key places in the five-movement development. The first is Psalm 72, the last Psalm of Book 1. The Psalm opens with a direct reference to his father, David, and Solomon's relationship to the promises of the Davidic covenant. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Solomon may have composed this psalm on the occasion of his coronation, but clearly it is meant to signal the transition of the promises of Yahweh's anointed from David to his royal son. Verse 8 proclaims that he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, hearkening back to Psalm 2, 8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession, and the Davidic covenant itself. Similarly, Solomon's other composition, Psalm 127, is a meditation on the Davidic covenant. His reference to house, unless the Lord builds the house, is not just any house, but the house promised to David. I tell you that the Lord will build you a house, 1 Chronicles 17.10. When verse 3 proclaims, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the word translated children is literally sons and directly references the Davidic royal line. Just a few psalms later, Psalm 132 uses the same term in an explicit quotation of the Davidic covenant. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. Psalm 132, 11 and 12. However, like Adam and like David his father before him, Solomon fails to be the perfect mediator of God's rule on earth. God's promise that he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, Psalm 72, 8, does not come to pass under Solomon's rule. The prophet Zechariah will quote this promise later as something yet unfulfilled. In fact, as a direct result of disobedience to God's prohibitions against multiplying horses, wealth, and wives, the entire nation of Israel rebelled against the rule of Yahweh. Solomon's heir, Rehoboam, walked in ungodly counsel, and the nation split in two. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. 2 Chronicles 10.19 Yet Solomon's failure did not annul God's covenant with David. Indeed, as David proclaims in Psalm 1850, great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. And after reaffirming his delight in God's law in Psalm 19, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb, David affirms his confidence in God's faithfulness to his covenant. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed, he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Psalm 26. And, The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, literally victory, how greatly shall he rejoice. Psalm 21, 1. Yet in this section of Messianic Psalms, Psalms 20 through 24, David begins to hint at the reality that the ultimate fulfillment of God's covenant with him will be fulfilled by a critically important relationship between the rule of God's anointed and the sovereign rule of Yahweh himself. For example, while Psalms 20 and 21 focus on the certain rule of David's throne, Psalms 20 and 23 reaffirm the certain rule of Yahweh's throne. 
For the kingdom is Yahweh's, and he rules over the nations. Psalm 22:28. This connection between the anointed one's rule and Yahweh's rule is critical for understanding the canonical flow of the Psalms and, indeed, the progress of redemptive history. God promised to bless humankind by exercising his sovereign dominion through man as his mediatorial king over the earth. Adam failed, and so God promised the fulfillment of his dominion blessing in another seed of the woman. He narrowed that promise in his covenant with David, vowing to bring about his blessing through David's seed. David's son failed, but God remained faithful to his promise through David's greater son. This side of the cross, we now know that this is Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man. God fulfilled his promise of blessing by uniting his sovereign throne with the mediatorial throne of man in a son of David, who is both God and man, Jesus the Anointed One. Each of the Messianic Psalms certainly apply to David and his royal seed, but ultimately they are fulfilled in David's greater son. The Apostle Paul interpreted the reference to God's anointed in Psalm 2 in exactly this way. Acts 13, 32, and 33 say, And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. In other words, the death and resurrection of Jesus is what established his right to rule as David's descendant, whose kingdom will be forever. This recognition opens up a powerful reality for both the interpretation and use of the Psalms for us today. These songs are not obsolete and inapplicable for Christians today. As Michael Lefebvre observes, when you sing the Psalms, you are actually singing the songs of Jesus with Jesus as your song leader. You can read this essay at g3min.org.